Hello and welcome back to Creator Talks. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. My guest today is Sam Johnson from Sheffield, England. Sam is returning to talk about his book, Geek Girl, which has a free edition coming out on Free Comic Book Day, a digital edition, and we're going to tell you how you can get that free copy without leaving your home. He also has the continuing story of Geek Girl coming up in the second arc of the series at the end of this month. Sam and I talk about Geek Girl, who she is, where she's been, what she's been through, and what's coming up next. Sam also talks about the creative team that returns to continue the second arc of Geek Girl. Sam and I also talk about fan reception to the book, and Sam answers my questions about himself. Eight questions I ask all my guests so we get to learn a little more about them, and that's the fun part of the show. I learned so much about the creators through these questions, and so will you. Now, I did mention that I was on special assignment last week, and at the end of this episode, I will talk about that special assignment. What it was, a family vacation. We went to my favorite place, our favorite place, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Death Valley, California. Now, I'm not just going to talk about the vacation. Yes, somehow comics and music tie into this. So I'm going to cover those books that I caught up on while on the flight and some music that I listened to, some that was suggested from listeners. And so I will pass those recommendations along. I hope you enjoyed the two episodes that I posted last week, and I hope you enjoy this one. Sam Johnson and I discuss his book, Geek Girl, his free comic book day book, and free comic book day. Here now on Creator Talks. Johnson, welcome back to Creator Talks. Hi, Christopher. Thank you for having me back. We're here to talk about Geek Girl. There's a special free comic book day issue coming out. Free comic book day is May 5th. It's the first Saturday of every May. It's been going on since 2002, and it's one of those things where there's a book for everyone, and they're trying to get in new customers, people who haven't read comics, people who are thinking about reading comics. And one thing I do want to point out, before we begin, is that these books, they're free to the people coming in on May 5th, but they're not free to the comic book store. They do pay for them. So when you go in, like I will, I'll get my free comic books and then you buy something. <laughs> you know, just help them out a little bit. I mean, most stores, at least the one in my area, will have a sale on that day. It's a big day to drive in new customers. Now, Sam, in England, is free comic book day a big thing? I hear that there's more of a to-do. No, you make uh, more of a show of it in America. I'm not aware in England of anywhere that does like a, a huge deal. I mean, my local comic shop is, is quite small. Uh, we go, we get our free comics. As you say, they'll have a sale on that. But um, it's not an elaborate affair, but it's uh, it's cool. Anyway, it's it's a good event. And the, the other thing to mention as well is that it's not just uh, in comic shops like the, the free comic book day Facebook group, uh, which I'm involved with, is going to have free digital comics throughout the day, uh, one of which will be the aforementioned uh, Geek Girl one. Very good. Yeah, I guess I was misinformed about, maybe it was like there was one store that had a big event and it got a lot of press, and that's why they said, it's a bigger thing over in London. Yeah, <laughs> but that's, that's probably, you know, it got a lot of press because it was a big thing, as in that was like kind of an, an anomaly. It's cool anyway. Well, let me ask you about Geek Girl. You have a comic book coming out on free comic book day that's geek girl with a hyphen like you would spider-man and we're going to find out what happened to ruby k at the end of the last issue we get a little update on that but i read it and what i like about it is that it very quickly brings you up to date whether you've never read geek girl before or not yeah you get caught up you find out where she is and you find out what's coming up next so tell me a bit about it and also tell me, how did you manage to get this to be part of Free Comic Book Day? It's a digital only comic. It's not going to be in comic shops. I didn't come up with like an idea of that long ago. But we've got the new geek, the first issue of the new Geek Girl miniseries coming out on the end of May. So I thought it'd be a quite a cool way to set that up and prep people for that. And as you say, it recaps. It's got material in it from volume one, from what will be volume two. And it gets people up to speed and uh, hopefully excited for what we've, we've got coming in volume two, which is in itself is, is going to be a good jump on thing because without giving away the reveal at the end of the free comic book day digital comic, things are going somewhere new in the new miniseries. So those that aren't familiar with Geek Girl, 
Geek Girl is Ruby K, hot, popular college chick who's used to get what, getting what she wants. On a whim, she lands this pair of super tech glasses off the resident college brainiac and um, sort of falls into becoming a superhero. Initially, all that happens is she's trying to sort of demonstrate her new powers to her friends and makes a clots of herself and knocks drinks over them and alienates herself from a clique. Uh, with the exception of Summer, who's her best friend and who is into superheroes and is, is the one that puts the idea of becoming a superhero into her head and also drives her to do that. And when Ruby K really becomes a superhero is when she's, uh, she's out looking for crime. She doesn't really know what she's doing. She stumbles upon Neon Girl, the big shot superhero of where she lives in Maine, getting taken out by this mysterious new villain, Lightning Storm. Uh, so what we've got in volume one, and we kind of build to this uh, Geek Girl versus Lightning Storm thing, which you get the climax of it in the free comic book day book. And how would you get this digitally? Is this through your website? The free comic book day Facebook group is going to be the easiest way to get it. You can also get it from geekgirlcomics.com. If you sign up to the mailing list of that, you'll automatically be sent it on free comic book day. And that's where you can also get the next arc of Geek Girl is through your website, geekgirlcomics.com. The first issue will be out on May the 30th. It'll be available uh, in Comixology for your digital, Indie Planet for print, and uh, yeah, also through the website where you can also get Volume 1 as well. Geek Girl Volume 1 Lightning Strikes is also on Amazon. And I noticed that you're starting this arc with a number one, which is not a bad idea because you don't want to put people off and go, oh, I missed the first arc, or oh, I didn't get that trade paperback. You know, and the zero issue catches you right up. I mean, it's been a while since I've read it, so I was like, oh, yeah, right, right, okay. So it's very, very helpful, and it's free. <laughs> so yeah, you don't even have to leave your house. <laughs> you know, it's just like download don't it. Don't even have to leave your house, Christopher. <laughs> so that's, that's how easy we're making it for you. You know, it's fun to be part of Free Comic Book Day, just releasing... Uh, a free digital comic in isolation doesn't have the same buzz as doing it as part of that. Now, both the Zero issue, and I want to ask, is the next arc of the series being drawn by Carlos Granada, who did the oh, Zero yeah. issue? Okay, great. We've got Carlos, uh, the artist from Series 1, back. We've got Chan Lin Zhao, the main colorist from Series 1, back, and Paul McLaren, the main letter from Series 1, back. So it's great to have the creative team together doing the great job they do on it. And um, I'm really, really pleased with, with Issue 1, which is done. Issue 2 is, is not too far off. We've got big things coming. In it. I mean, what's happened at the end of the first series is because of the damage Lightning Storm has done, there's a kind of dearth of uh, law enforcement in Maine, and Neon Girl, the big, big superhero, got taken off the map as well. So there's this new bunch of quirky individuals called the League of Lastinists that pitch up and are looking to sort of make it big by capitalizing on the, the hole in law enforcement They're looking to grow in number so they're pulling bank jobs and uh, there's not that much getting in their way because as we see in the free digital comic the free comic book day one uh, ruby k geek girl is uh, somewhat incapacitated shall we say at this time and you know for those who have not seen the art one thing i do is i, I make a little promo video including the art when i announce the episode coming up my interview with you so you can see there also on the website but i make it easy when i put it on social media you'll see not only get a notification about the interview but you also see the art coming up a little sample a little taste of it so and i mentioned that because if you haven't seen Carlos's work and the rest of the team, it's very good. And Sam's a great writer. It's a very good read. I always enjoy it. I'm always engrossed by it. And it's no BS. I mean that honestly. So uh, really, for free, check it out. And then you can order the next series coming up on you know, 5.30. It's a great read. It's a fun read. It puts the excitement and fun and freshness back into superhero comics because i don't read a lot of superhero comics but this one's different definitely something you can make room for on your list thank you christopher one of the things i like about it there is a freshness to it because ruby k is is not your sort of conventional super heroine she's fallen into this i think things feel kind of real in inverted commas 
um, like she's, you know, she's scared going up against lightning storm. Uh, and one of the other things that I like about it is that it's unpredictable. I don't think people will will see the reveal that we get in the free comic book day book at the end of it i don't think people will see that coming and also what goes down in this mini series a real shock moment in there at some point i like to keep it unpredictable the the actual original intentions of what i was going to do with the second mini series have barely used at all and changed it up and gone in and what i hope is it as an exciting new direction it is it's a direction i didn't expect but the way you lay it out and it makes sense. You can see how it could go that direction, but that's part of the freshness of it I like is that it's not a paint by numbers superhero book by no. any imagination. <laughs> and it, it, you know, you give yourself the flexibility to as a creator to alter the story as you go along. It's like, hmm, I think I want to go this direction. So you're not locked in because hey, it's yours. You can do whatever you want, and it makes it exciting for the reader. And with the villains as well, there's a quirkiness, a, a weirdness to them, but there's also uh, you know a, a human side like this, the League of Lastness that we introduce. They've all got code names, and the leader is called Pighead because he's got a, a sort of a half pig, half human brain that's been sewn together he likes to uh give the rest of the team code names which can be quite derogatory so one of the newbies who's kind of not all in and pighead wants everyone to be all in so this kind of winds up pighead so he gets labeled with the unfortunate uh, once they learn that his, his wife has made him have a vasectomy he gets uh lumbered with the unfortunate moniker of numb nuts uh which <laughs> which he's not uh he's not too happy about there's a bit of enough conflict within that team and, and we get to, uh, later on in the art we get Chromex coming in who's this robot that speaks in a sort of odd street-esque manner but who has its own agenda as well and, and it kind of lands with the league through circumstances without it making the conscious decision to join them so Chromex and Numbnuts form a kind of alliance within the league. And there's another guy in the league, Mongo, uh, who's got the hots for this this other girl in it. And so there's a lot of sort of interpersonal uh, dynamics going on within that. And it's it's quite a funny setup as well. There's something else about Geek Girl. You know, she has a superpower glasses. And I would read that and think, hmm. You know, she doesn't have, like, a band to keep her glasses on. Could that be an Achilles heel? And, well, you'll just have to read to find out, is that an Achilles heel? The question has been raised before because her powers come from Trevor Goldstein, the college brainiac, invented these super tech glasses. The intention was for him to wear them and become this superhero to make this girl, Mariella, uh, waitress fall for him and then that all got screwed up when Ruby and her friend Stacy came along and got Trevor and his drunk horny friend Jeff more drunk and beat them again in a strip poker which is how Ruby landed the glasses so the powers come from a chip that's in the glasses so they give us super strength and uh, flight powers. But yeah, the question has come up before. Well, you know, they're just a pair of glasses. Couldn't someone else get hold of these and use them? And uh, yes, that is a question that is going to be answered in, in issue one. Those are great glasses. You know, mine can only see small type. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could use you those. Know, that's, a, that's a kind of minor superpower. Isn't <laughs> yeah, minor, <it>? yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sam, will you be going to a local comic book shop, your local comic book shop, for free comic book day. And is there anything you've set your sights on to check out? Yeah, there's a lot of books I'm interested in coming out this year. I mean, we've got the new Spider-Man with uh, Nick Spencer, the man responsible for turning Captain America into uh, a, a sleeper Hydra man, which uh, wasn't my favorite thing ever. He did good stuff on... Uh, what was it called? Superior Foes of Spider-Man. And I can see he's going to be bringing those characters in. That could be interesting. The IDW, I believe, are, are, are wrapping up their, uh, their Transformers series. And we've got this uh, Unicron big event thing. So there's like an issue zero for that in free comic book day uh so those are the ones i'm most interested in but uh my store tends to like you have five and I'm, I'm sure that there's more than five that i would be interested in if you can go to the free comic book uh, day website you can see like previews of all the all the ones that are going to be in comic shops there yeah they do list them i know my shop does have a limit 
I think it's two for adults and three for kids under a certain age. So naturally, I bring my son. Actually, if I bring them both, hmm. Yeah, <laughs> say, yeah. We can divide and conquer. Bring someone else's kid as well. <laughs> <laughs> Just round up a bunch hey, of Hey, kid, kids. come here. Get all of them comics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking at like Valiant Shadow Man special because I'm a big fan of Shadow Man. The Mall coming out from Scout Comics, and that looks pretty good. I'm going to check that out. I actually got a copy of Amazing Age by Matthew David Smith, number zero. I backed that project, and that's going to be out on Free Comic Book Day. That's an um, Alterna comic, one of the uh, newsprint comics. It's always great to see independent comics. Yeah, the name escapes me, uh, and it's not. Uh, really sort of the kind of thing I read but the, I know there's a new indie book coming out from Brian K. Vaughan as well so which is that's obviously a, you know a big big deal. Drawn in Quarterly has Berlin number one I don't know if that's tied into the recent TV series and my glasses aren't that super powerful I can see right. the type <laughs> but that's something I might check out hopefully my shop gets most of these I know a lot of shops don't get them all because well like I said they have to pay for them and, yeah. uh, you know, it's money out of their pocket, but it's great promotion. I've been in the store and it does bring in a lot of people. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, there's, I go in and there's, there's always a, a, a long queue. And some people do dress up, you know, some stores will have like costume contests oh, yeah. and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they recently had one at my shop for, um, Superman, the Action Comics 1000, you know, come in with your best spit curl and there's a contest right. for that or dress up your pet, you know, that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> This is what we're we're missing the the whole dressing I, up your pets and superheroes thing. That's, yeah. uh, <laughs> so someone needs to get on that in the UK. I think. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't realize, and I thought I had, and I had not. Ask you the questions I ask all my guests to learn more about you as a creator, as a person, so people can kind of connect with you a little more. You know, know cool. something about Sam. So. Uh, they're just fun questions. No big deal. No sweat. Take your time answering them. There's no right or wrong answer. First question, simply, what do you like to do, Sam, for rest and relaxation? Rest and relaxation. Well, I, I enjoy a, a vodka and, and watching sitcoms primarily. Really into love on Netflix. That's my matter, something I, I just I really enjoy. And also, obviously, hanging out with, with friends, doing that. But... Uh, yeah, that's my uh, main uh, way of chillaxing. Does anyone say chillaxing anymore? Yes. I, was say, I was saying that ironically, <laughs> just to be clear on that. <laughs> yeah, we we like to stream here at the house, too. And uh, a couple of things we've been watching. I don't know if you've seen them, but then um, this is on Amazon, I believe, The Tick. No, I, I don't have Amazon. I'm, I'm aware of it. But uh, yeah, I don't have Amazon Prime. It's very good. It's uh, it's a different superhero. It's funny offbeat so yeah it's worth checking out oh yeah yeah i am pretty sure i'd like it now thinking back to a birthday any birthday that stands out in your mind why does it stand out was it someone that was there was it a special place was it the gift what was that birthday uh well one was i don't know quite how this even happened we went to see um jason donovan which I'm, I'm not even a fan of this is quite some time ago i don't know how well known he is over there i mean here kylie minogue is a he's a huge thing and because of his connection with her are you aware of jason donovan i'm not so he's out of uh, originally same as kylie minogue this australian soap opera neighbors and then they both embarked on singing careers uh, of which Kylie is, uh, I, I say, I don't think she's uh, makes too much of an impact in America, but in Britain, she's huge. Her new album went straight in at number one. Anyway, so somehow my friends took me to Jason Donovan, and uh, whereas Kylie's star has, you know, re remained in the stratosphere, Jason Donovan not so much, and he he looked like he just, he was, it was, I don't think he was literally wearing sweatpants, but he looked like he just got up from his couch and come in to do the set. <laughs> uh, and it was it was somewhat underwhelming, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't know if that's a particularly good reason to, to remember the birthday. And it, but, it, you know, it wasn't, like, bad, but uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't exactly uh, a five-star uh, choreographed <laughs> <laughs> performance. Well, it didn't have to be a happy memory. <laughs> Just be one that no, stands out. Know, it's, it's, <laughs> It's kind of happy, as I say. It's, it's not. It's not bad as such. But uh, I, if if I'd have paid any significant amount of money for it, I would have <laughs> not been happy. <laughs> 
Now think back as a youth, adolescent, in your room, what posters or pictures did you have on the wall? Well, comics. Uh, I had just like a, a wall of photocopy covers from comics. So, yeah, I mean, I, I remember that vividly. I, it was back in like the days of uh, Secret Wars 2. Every comic was crossing over with Secret Wars 2. The sequel where the Beyonder came to Earth, which I think is is somewhat maligned. I think that adds some moments. And I, I, I remember at, at this moment where in the first issue, the X-Men are involved. And I think this is when Magneto was leading them. And, and they're in this car and he's just like lifts this car that they're in off the ground and makes this car fly, which is a trick I haven't seen him do before. And that was cool. Uh, I mean, the, the um, Beyonder's look, I think, is part of the reason it's maligned. <laughs> Sort of bizarre sort of uh, what would would call that hair like a disco outfit and it's, this... yeah it's got like a disco outfit and this curly sort of kiss curl esque hairdo uh, which I don't know where that came from and I think yeah that is part of the problem where is he gone from being in the original secret was this uh, you know malevolent entity that wasn't even visible he's now taken human form and that's the form he's gone for <laughs> <laughs> have you gone back and read that series and the crossovers does it still hold up for you because i know sometimes you go back and see movies or read comics and go oh that wasn't as good as i remember it because when you're young it's all new and it's fresh and it's exciting have you gone back I, I haven't, but that's partly just because of the volume of current comics I get. Keeping up with them is more than enough. But no, no, now we're talking about, I remember there was some interesting things. I think he had some sort of thing going on with Dazzler and it introduced Boom Boom, who's off of X-Force and in the current New Mutants series. I think it, does, it was it's quite different. Event comics, you know, you, you expect a certain thing from them. And this, and this was something else. I think it may have dated because like we were saying about the beyonders look and that although i think that was viewed as ridiculous at the time anyway <laughs> but uh i think it may have been something of its time i would be interested to look at it again the secret was we had since then was again something radically different where they sort of brought back every event ever you know, the, the Secret Wars was Secret Wars because they took a bunch of superheroes and, and a bunch of villains and put them on this world to do battle. And that was secret because it was removed from Earth. I think another criticism possibly of Secret Wars 2 is there was nothing secret about it. Beyond it comes to Earth, he's very, <laughs> very uh, visible. Oh, good stuff. The last Secret Wars I enjoyed as well. When it was effectively, as, as has been said, it was effectively a, a fantastic Four versus Doctor Doom story. And that part of it was very interesting. And I've been interested to follow what's going on with those characters since Doctor Doom becoming a, a new Iron Man and, and the Marvel 2 and 1 book I'm in, enjoying. And it's, you kind of don't know where it's going. Although we now have had the reveal that the FF will be returning under Mr. Dan Slott, which is something else I'm looking forward to. I've never that much connected with the FF, but reading what I've been reading recently, like the thing was prevalent in Brian Michael Bendis's um, infamous Iron Man, the Doctor oh, Doom. Yes. And I Alex kind of, Malieve did the artwork on that. Yes, yes. And I've kind of got into the thing and yeah, I'm really enjoying it. It's one of my favorite books at the moment, actually, this Marvel 2 and 1 thing. I'm glad the FF's coming back because it's been too long. Gosh, it feels like it's been four or five years. It feels like a long time. And that was the foundation of Marvel back then, Fantastic Four, because of this whole Fox and Marvel Studios thing. I'm glad that they put that behind so we can now have the first family back. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's never been overtly stated, but I would imagine part of the reason that the FF was cancelled was just because they wanted that movie to just tank and didn't want to give it any oxygen. And also, I think it was slightly damaging to the whole franchise and possibly part of the reason it's taken as long as it has for them to relaunch the Fantastic Four is, is so that that is just a, a very faded memory. And now we can get back to the real deal. And I think that not publishing the comic did not have an impact on damaging the movie. I think it did it on its own. Oh, oh no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, oh, no, for sure. But I think it's kind of a statement where at the same sort of time as this movie's coming out, we're cancelling the book. There's obviously going to be a, a crossover element between sure. the two. 
uh, for the audience. So I think it, it doesn't it certainly doesn't help the movie when you pull the plug on the, the comic when it's been released. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, still thinking back to your room growing up, what was on your turntable or your Walkman? What were you listening to? My musical tastes uh, are kind of uh, pretty consistent. I was into They Might Be Giants. I still am. I've got the current album, Pet Shop Boys, which I've, I had most of on tape, and I've been rebuying those on uh, on CD. Those are stand out for me. I have two of my favorite bands. Now, moving on to books, if you were stuck on a deserted island and you could only take one book with you, what would that book be? I don't, partly because, again, of the volume of comics I consume. I don't read prose books, so it would be Brian Michael Bendis's got a book on, on writing comics, which I read and uh, found uh, quite valuable and would be more than happy to, uh, to revisit. Okay, that's a good choice. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a serious prose novel. It can be a trade collection or something. So that's a great choice. I would really like to read that book too. It's a good read. It's interesting, yeah. And, and you know, as I say, for any comic writers or wannabe comic writers, you, you'll definitely get something out of it. Now, another question, hypothetical. If a toy company were to make an action figure of you, what would be your accessory? Uh, <laughs> probably a, a karaoke mic, as I've uh, used to bill myself as Sheffield self-proclaimed number one Robbie Williams tribute act on karaoke, uh, which is <laughs> which is since since retired because I I didn't want to do the the new stuff. Not that I don't like it. I'm a big fan of, of Robbie Williams, uh, but yeah, that used to kind of be my uh, my ting. Uh, so that, there you go, yeah. And maybe like a sort of Robbie wig to go with it as well. <laughs> that's, that's great. Now, I normally ask next, what is your beverage of choice? You said vodka. To borrow from Alexi Sale, the poor man's Nintendo. Because it makes <laughs> you go, <"Yeah!"> and so on. <laughs> Final question. What question have you never been asked by an interviewer that you want to be asked? Something that you want people to know about you that no one has ever asked a question? That's a one, Christopher. Uh, I guess uh, what kind of uh, music influences my work. We always talk about what influences my work in terms of comics, uh, and my answer is always the biggest influence is, is Doom Patrol, uh, the Grant Morrison one, which is out there and weird and kind of inspired me to be able to sort of think in weird mode when coming up with certain things. And I'm sure that uh, the League of Larsonists comes from that. But uh, music is, is also uh, an influence. With You Girl, for example, I've always had in mind, I mean, the intention is to get the first series turned into a movie. And I always had in mind the climax where you've got Geek Girl versus Lightning Storm. If you listen to Leona Lewis's run and think of sort of the lyrics as coming from Summer's perspective, I think it enhances it. So I'd, I'd, for those that have the fourth issue of the first series or the trade, I recommend re-listening to that, re-reading it with that uh, soundtrack playing. There's, in fact, there's a link if you go to my blog, just Google Sam Johnson Comics, there's a thing there that sort of tells you what point to come in, and I think it really adds an emotional layer to it. And I will put that in the show notes, where to read your blog and where to order Geek Girl, number one, coming out on 5-30-2018. Do you plan to make any appearances in support of the book? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, at the moment, the budget isn't there to do America, but certainly in the UK, I've got uh, three things lined up for May. Uh, one in where I live in Sheffield. Any information on these, uh, a good place to go is the Geek Girl Facebook group. Uh, so anyone, any UK listeners will be able to uh, to get info on that and we'll be able to come and get the book signed if that's how you choose to live your life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, join that Facebook group because you will get updates on Geek Girl when it's available, 
on yeah. special programs like Kickstarters or you know trade paperbacks and how to, can you still get the trade paperback uh, volume one? You can go lightning strikes. You can get it at Amazon. I mean, I mean, it's in constant sort of print on demand. Yeah, and people should go back and read that. How has the audience been? The response since you launched the book? It's been great. People have connected with it. I think you know the character. There is something about Ruby and the look as well. And I think a girl's sort of like you know girls with glasses kind of like having that sort of you know oh that's a superhero with my glasses and it's been well received i put you know a, a lot of work into it i spent a long time tweaking it and getting it just how i want and um which i have been doing with the new series as well and i'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm really proud of of what the creative team has done you know really so with the first issue of this new series i think something that becomes quite apparent is the sort of universe of ruby because with the role role in inverted commas that she plays in the first issue so we really get to see the other characters breathe and get more uh, screen time and in inverted commas and you know there's some fun characters in there like pitbull the the jock superhero who, who features in the first mini is back we're going to see another thing is ruby's clique that were alienated by her actions they didn't take this whole superhero thing seriously they thought it was all kind of a joke and she ruined their dresses by trying to demonstrate her powers and knocking drinks over them and uh, you know they kind of disconnected from her and so it was a kind of a loser and now, after the events of the first miniseries, well, she's just saved the frickin' city. So, you know, they're the kind of girls that want to be part of what's popular. So, you know, she's the saviour of Maine now. So they might change their mind a little bit on uh, how they look at her. And if that doesn't get your interest, I don't know what will, folks. So <laughs> do check it out. First one's free. Free comic book day coming up on Saturday, May 5th. Digitally, you don't have to leave the house. You can sit there in your jammies and read <laughs> comics. <laughs> what a time to be alive. <laughs> Sam Johnson, thank you so much for being on Creator Talks. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Sam Johnson. I recorded that conversation with Sam right before I left for my trip to Las Vegas, Nevada, and Death Valley, California. It was in the morning that I talked to Sam, and then by that evening, we were on the plane with both kids, Nolan, six, and Declan, just under two years of age. Now, this was Nolan's third trip to Las Vegas, his second to Death Valley, and this was Declan's first time going to both and being on a plane. He did fairly well. He's a little more fussy than Nolan, had a tough time getting to sleep, but we did go in the evening, so we arrived what would have been 1 o'clock in the morning Eastern Standard Time, so we were pretty knackered when we got there. We stayed at the Red Rocks Hotel and Casino, and the reason why I tell you this, and this is not a paid commercial or anything, I'm just telling you because if you have children and you want to go to Las Vegas, it's hard to do because how do you spend time out having fun as parents when you have little kids? Well, Red Rocks Hotel and Casino is off the strip. It's a full-size hotel, casino, shops, restaurants, everything, and the kids' fun zone. So what we could do is take both kids to a licensed daycare facility. You have to present your kids proof of immunization shots. No photographs are allowed inside. Parents can't go behind the counter, but you can see the kids back there. And Nolan and Declan both had a blast and wanted to go back every day. It's not free. You have to pay for it. But it's not much more than a babysitter would charge you. And you can go within the hotel to dinner, watch a movie, gamble, whatever, in the same place. A lifesaver for parents so you do get a chance to get a break. Now, when we got into our room, here's one thing that was a little crazy. Hotels have mini bars. We've all seen the refrigerator. Don't take anything out of the refrigerator. We have to pay for it. So we told the kids that. Well, at least Nolan. Declan didn't quite get it. But there's also alcohol on display on a table above the refrigerator on sensors. So if you remove the drink, if you don't put it back within 45 seconds, you're charged for it. And Declan thought they were really, really cool. So we're freaking out. Oh my, don't put that back, put that back. And eventually the hotel said, look, don't worry about it. Just put a towel over it. If something gets moved, just let us know and we'll take care of it. Because if it's not consumed, they won't charge you for it. They're very fair about it. It's just a little nerve wracking for parents. Well, Declan grabbed the adult pleasure kit which is also part of the mini bar. And we put it back. Ah, we called, told them about it. And they go, oh, yes, we see here at 11.50 p.m. that the adult pleasure kit was moved. Now think about this. <laughs> 
if you were there on a honeymoon or a second honeymoon or with a girlfriend or boyfriend and you did decide to use it, they know you used it. They know what you were doing. So that's really creepy. But anyway, you know, that wasn't a problem. Walking around the hotel in the casino area, I did see signs for acts that would be appearing in Las Vegas. And I'm sorry that I missed some of them because I wasn't there at the time that they would be performing, even though it would be tough for the kids because, you know, you don't leave the hotel casino while they're in daycare. But two that I thought were pretty cool. Kiefer Sutherland and his band was appearing and was sold out. Also, that was going to be appearing, Alice Cooper, along with Ace Freely of Kiss. Can you imagine? What a pair. I wish I could see that. Now, here's a comic book tie-in. The first day we woke up in the hotel, we got a copy of the newspaper, came to our door. This was on a Sunday, and it was the Las Vegas Review Journal. And I opened it up, and in the entertainment section is a headline, October 1st shooting inspires artists' anthology. So, a guest on my show, J.H. Williams III, and his wife talk about the anthology that they're putting together where we live. So I was surprised to see that. And as you know, J.H. Williams and his wife, Wendy, they both live in Las Vegas. Now you might say, Chris, why didn't you catch up with them? Well, I tried, but they were both very busy. J.H. was still laying out the final details for the book. A lot of people participated in this anthology and a lot were coming into the last minute and he wanted to make sure everything was just right and there was a tight deadline. So he was super busy, but he was working on it and I cannot wait to see it. I'm really, really looking forward to the book. So it was a pleasant surprise to see this article that Sunday. Now, the missus and I didn't have a whole lot of time when the kids went to the daycare because, you know, you do pay for it. So it's not free. But we did get a chance to go to a restaurant every day that they were in there. And we always went back to the same place, the Yard House at Red Rock. And as you know, my beverage of choice among them is IPA. So I tried out as many of the local brews as I could, not all in one sitting. I only had one, maybe two. And, uh, and I went back there and had different ones. So I did try the House IPA, which was from Salt Lake City. It was very good. Bad Beat Hoppy Times IPA, which is made in Henderson, Nevada. That one was a little bit stronger. Uh, other ones I tried was Green Flash Remix, which I have had here in Delaware. It's out of San Diego, California. And they also, at the Yard House, had a House Belgian Amber Triple. Just have one of those. It is a triple. So it's a great restaurant at the resort. Very good appetizers and beers, craft beers, house brewed beers, especially during happy hour. So uh, that's a good way to save a little bit of money when you're on a vacation. I did gamble a little bit. We're talking $5 at a blackjack machine. That's it. It was purely entertainment. Wasn't trying to win any money. Didn't win any money. And I didn't really care. I was just there to have some fun and play that machine. That was it. We did visit Red Rocks Park while we were there. I did go to the Las Vegas Overlook Trail, took Declan partway up just very, very briefly because it's a long trail to see the Overlook and see the strip at the top of the uh, mountain there. But we did a little bit of that, and we also went to Bonnie Springs Ranch, which was not really open that day. There weren't any performers at this Old West town, but there was a zoo there. So I did take some pictures, and the kids, of course, loved it, and Declan thought everything was a doggy. And we had been there before, too, with Nolan. So after that time in Las Vegas, we headed out to Death Valley. We always stop in Pahrump, which is in Nevada, about an hour outside of Death Valley, load up on groceries and food because there's really nothing out there in Death Valley other than the few shops that are open. And there weren't many open, and I'll get back to that. So we drove into Death Valley and stayed at the Furnace Creek Ranch, which was undergoing renovations. And it's actually going to change its name to like Paradise Ranch. And it's great. They have a pool. And the pool's fed by Warm Springs, so I did spend time in the pool with the kids, and that was great. Uh, they do have a little motel there, but the problem was it's all under construction. Now, you may have heard of this place from the TV show Ride, Norman Reedus's Ride on AMC. He stayed at the nicer hotel, the Furnace Creek Hotel, the very nice, lavish one at the top of the hill. But the ranch itself, they're redesigning a lot of it so that the look of the architecture fits in with the nicer hotel. And so... The gift shop was knocked down, the restaurant was knocked down, and the bar that I wanted to go to was knocked down, all being reconstructed. So the only thing that was open was a restaurant that was a shelter they put up, no table service, like a cafeteria. The workers were in there, the guests were in there, the bar was now a little corner of this shelter type building. It's like a giant shed building with a concrete floor. It had AC and everything, but it was not what you would think of as a restaurant, not what we were used to going there. 
and I'm not saying this to be whiny, like, oh, we're entitled, or we have to have this nice, you know, well, you're, in, you're in Death Valley, come on. But it is a resort. So we've been there three times before. We knew what the cost and quality of the food was there at the ranch, and it just wasn't there. The motel was fine, even though we found a cockroach in there. No, honest to God, we did. <laughs> I had to remove it. Um, it's one of those kind of outdoor cockroaches, but still, it's part of the cockroach family. Kind of gross. Um, but that wasn't too bad. But as far as what you pay to spend your time there, it wasn't discounted. It was no less, but there was less. So that was unfortunate. That was kind of disappointing. I don't blame the staff working there, but as far as what you would expect, like the bar used to be this kind of cozy little tavern room, and I would get my bad water beer when I went out there. And I did manage to get one from the bar that was there. So small victory, and I know it's nothing special. It's just labeled as bad water, and it's made by some other brewer, but still, it's kind of fun to have that. So at least there was that. And we did enjoy Death Valley itself. Uh, going out there with the kids on some of the shorter trails because it was way too hot during the afternoon. Las Vegas and Death Valley were both hotter than normal this time of year by about 10-15 degrees, which we didn't expect. So Death Valley, I saw the reading, was 108. And in Las Vegas, it was about 95. A dry heat, yes. Drink a lot of water and use sunscreen. But still, it's hot. Really hot that time of year. We also went to a ghost town, Rheolite, that we've been to a couple times before, but I don't think Nolan had been there. And this was a mining town that was established back in around 1901, was booming for about 15 years, and then once the mine was done and they didn't have anything else to mine, they closed up. And it just was emptied out, and there's still some remains of the buildings that were there at the time. And it was a full town with a bank and stores and everything. And so we walked around. And checked everything out. And it does have signs saying, beware, rattlesnakes keep out, you know, back in where the buildings are. You stay on the main road. And I took Nolan through and said, now be careful and, you know, keep a look at your surroundings and everything. And everything was fine. And then a little later, he's like, daddy, I have to go to the bathroom. I'm like, okay, I'll take you. So we're walking along the road to go to an outdoor bathroom facility, you know, kind of one of those in-ground septic tank things put in by the park services. And as we're approaching it, I hear this rattle. And there on the side of the road, underneath a bush, is a rattlesnake. Now, in all my trips to the southwest, I have never encountered a snake. This was the first time I ever did. Nolan freaked. I said, ah, there it is. And fortunately, I was about 10 feet away. There was no way it could get me from there. But it was letting me know, you're a little too close, buddy. So I had a chance to take a picture of it. And I will post that on Twitter and Instagram. I am happy, though, that I did get a chance to encounter a snake or rattlesnake because I've always wanted to from a safe distance in the wild, and I did. So check that box. I'm done. That's enough. Plenty. <laughs> we also had a chance to see some wild burrows while we were driving back to Death Valley from the real light ghost town, which wasn't too far from Death Valley. It's about a half an hour. And we also saw the pupfish in Death Valley, which they only exist in Death Valley. There's a very small, shallow stream. I mean shallow, like a couple of inches. And these small, tiny fish actually survive in the desert year-round in that very small stream. They breed and have a very short lifespan. I think it's about a year. But we finally had a chance to see them because we'd never seen them before. We had always just seen the, the trail for it, but never any active fish. And this year we did. So that was a lot of fun. Ah, let me get back to the music I mentioned earlier just to kind of come full circle with comics before I wrap up here. I was working on show notes at my local watering hole when I encountered Anthony. And we were talking about heavy metal music and how much I enjoyed it now. And he said, you should check out the band The Sword. I said, okay. He said, if you like Mastodon, you'll like The Sword. I said, I will do that, sir. So while on vacation, I had a chance to download and listen to it. And he was right. It's really good. I really enjoy it. So I did a little research about the band because I knew nothing about them at all. Nothing. And I randomly picked an album to listen to uh, from their catalog. And I was reading about it. And then it got down to the cover artist of the album, The Sword. And the one I was reading about was the album called Apocryphon. And as I was reading the Wikipedia information about the band The Sword and this creation of the album Apocryphon, I find out that the cover artist for the album was J.H. Williams III. So there you go. Came full circle, interviewed him, saw him in the paper out in Las Vegas, and then while listening to this album for the first time and randomly picking an album from The Sword's catalog, J.H. Williams III did the cover art. And I'll wrap up 
just talking about the comics and the books I had a chance to read while on vacation, since this is a show about comic books anyway. I did have a chance to finally read the Richard Stark novel, the first of the Parker series, The Hunter. So I really did enjoy that. I'm reading the Bond novels now, written by Ian Fleming. So this kind of fits in that wheelhouse with being one of those period-type books from back in the 60s. So I really enjoy that, and it was a lot of fun. And I'm going to keep reading those, and I'm also going to read the Darwin Cook adaptations, the illustrated adaptations of those books after I've read the prose novel because I want to make sure I have a very deep understanding of the story and then see it illustrated. Something I highly recommend. I also had a chance to catch up on some back issue reading that I was behind on. Ice Cream Man through Image Comics by Prince, Marazzo, and O'Halloran. They were guests on my show, Prince and Marazzo. So I had a chance to catch up on issues 2, 3, and 4. And 4 came out recently. And man, each one stands alone. It's a great story, and it is weird, but it is really good. So if you like that story with the Twilight Zone vibe, this is the series for you. Other books I read also include Street Angel Goes to Juvie by former guest Jim Rugg. I really enjoyed reading that and look forward to hopefully seeing Jim again in the future at a con coming up soon. And by the way, he also has a free comic day book you might want to check out. It's called Street Angel Dog One-Shot. And one other one I want to throw out there that uh, just came out last week, I believe. Fear Agent Final Edition Volume 1. You've probably heard of the series by Rick Remender, Tony Moore, and Jerome Opina. A sci-fi story. It's the first ten issues, and it's described as when down-and-out alien exterminator Heath Houston stumbles upon an extraterrestrial plot to commit genocide against the human species, he must put down the bottle and resume his role as peacekeeper the galaxy's last fear agent. And if you like Rick Remender's work, well, definitely check this book out. I'm not selling these books, I'm just telling you. I read these on the flight, I read these in the hotel at night, and I really enjoyed them. Oh, one other thing I enjoyed too, if you like horror, I watched this series on Amazon Prime, and believe me, I had a full vacation, but there were times when there was downtime, it was too hot to be outside, I did have a chance to watch these, especially at night. And it was called 100 Years of Horror, And there are several episodes, and they're narrated by the late Christopher Lee. And he covers things like Frankenstein, Dracula, Werewolf. And there's a heavy emphasis on both Universal films and Hammer Horror films. It's really well done. Mind you, it's from 1996. So there's some really cheesy computer graphics at the beginning of it. But it's narrated by Christopher Lee. So if you like horror... He is a lot of fun to see in this. He's fully into it. He's Christopher Lee, after all. And you learn about a lot of films that are very obscure and that I've even never heard of. So, highly recommended. You should check it out. Again, I'm not getting anything for this. I'm just sharing with you things that I enjoyed and that you might enjoy, too. So, that's the vacation in a nutshell. It was great. We had a good time. Great to be back home. Back in the seat. Back to work. And I have guests coming up next week, too. As a matter of fact... Two returning guests, Ram V and Dev, on the trade paperback collection of Paradiso through Image Comics, and what's coming up next for Paradiso and for Ram V. I hope you'll come back and join us. Thank you for joining me for Creator Talks this week. The show is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and also on Amazon Echo and Dot Devices. Just say, Alexa, play podcast Creator Talks to hear the latest episode. In addition, you can listen to the show and follow it through Podbean. Your feedback is greatly appreciated, so please rate and review on iTunes if you like the show or an episode that you heard. Your ratings and reviews go a long way to helping the show, and I can't thank you enough for taking a bit of time to do that. For your convenience, in the show notes of each podcast, I have a link to my iTunes page where you can rate and review the show and see the entire list of shows available. If you haven't heard them all, take a look through. There are living legends and -and up-and-coming comic creators. Tell family and friends who like comics and comic book creators about the show. And to subscribe. The content is free. Just as valued are your comments and feedback. You can reach me through Facebook and Twitter at Creator Talks Pod. That's at Creator Talks Pod. You can also reach out to me by email. You can find that at my website, creatortalks.com. At the website, you will also find blog posts, reviews of books that I have read that you might want to read too, my catalog of podcasts, and videos and other written articles on the website, creatortalks.com. A hearty thank you to all my guests. It is an honor and a privilege for you to make time to be on the show and talk to me about your work. It is your knowledge and insight into the creative process that makes the show so unique. My thanks also goes out to my family who makes this show possible, 
especially my executive co-producer, Mrs. Calloway. I'll be back each and every Thursday with a new interview. For Creator Talks, I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time.